Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be reading Jonah chapter 4. This will be our last uh, sermon on Jonah. This displeased Jonah terribly, and he became very angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, this is just what I thought would happen when I was in my own country. This is what I tried to prevent by attempting to escape to Tarshish. Because I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, and one who relents concerning threatened judgment. So now, Lord, kill me instead, because I would rather die than live. The Lord said, Are you really so very angry? Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. He made a shelter for himself there and sat down under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. The Lord appointed a little plant and caused it to grow up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to rescue him from his misery. Now Jonah was very delighted about the little plant. So God sent a worm at dawn the next day and it attacked the little plant so it dried up. When the sun began to shine, God sent a hot east wind. So the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. So he despaired of life and said, I would rather die than live. God said to Jonah, Are you really so very angry about the little plant? And he said, I am as angry as I could possibly be. The Lord said, You were upset about this little plant, something for which you did not work, nor did you do anything to make it grow. It grew up overnight and died the next day. Should I not be even more concerned about Nineveh, this enormous city? There are more than 120,000 people in it who do not know right from wrong, as well as many animals. This is a word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In your bulletin, there's an outline, and on that outline, there's a QR code. If it's helpful to you, uh, if you click the QR code, it'll take you to uh, the full manuscript on our Facebook page, just scroll down, you can click the blog. That may be helpful for some of you. What are hindrances to faithful ministry, serving God and others with our whole hearts? Uh, In this story, you know it well. God commissioned Jonah to preach to the Ninevites who were an ungodly nation about to experience his judgment. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction towards Tarshish, which is in Spain, in rebellion to God's word. And so what God does is he's on this ship going to Tarshish. He brings a storm that threatens to destroy the entire ship and all the innocent sailors that were on the ship. Uh, Instead of doing that, they throw Jonah off the ship. uh, And as he's sinking, uh, God saves him through a large fish. Um, During that time in the fish, he prays, he repents to God. God has the fish to spew him out. And he goes and preaches judgment to Nineveh. He declares that in 40 days, God will bring judgment. Uh, Because of this, the Ninevites repent. It says from the greatest to the least of them, they put on sackcloth. They repented before the Lord. The king, it wasn't, it was instead of a top-down approach, it was from the bottom to the top. The king declares an absolute fast saying that neither, that no one should eat or drink in the kingdom, not even the animals. Because most societies in the world at that time were more agrarian, farm societies. This was basically saying it doesn't matter if our economy tanks. It doesn't matter if we can't provide for ourselves. We are in uh, in trouble with God. And so potentially this could be the greatest revival ever. Nineveh was one of the greatest kingdoms in the world at that time. They were a tremendously ungodly kingdom. They were known for how they ruthlessly ruthlessly treated their enemies. They would skin people alive. Instead of taking, when they conquered a nation, instead of taking the children and women, they would simply wipe them out. As we saw with Babylon, at least they took the children to their kingdom. Daniel and others, they took them to the kingdom. They would wipe out their children. And so the fact that these people repent is tremendous. Um, And so there's a great revival. However, even though Jonah was willing to repent and go and preach, We see in this narrative that Jonah is upset with God because he actually delivers Nineveh instead of destroying them. And so that's what we see in this narrative. Um, After accusing God of being too gracious, he leaves the city, 
builds a fort to watch and basically challenge. Instead of praying for revival there, he's accusing God of being too gracious and basically asking God to destroy them. So he, pits, he, put, he builds his fort to watch to see if God will destroy the city. Um, Jonah declared judgment with no desire to help the Ninevites repent and come to a saving knowledge of Yahweh. Instead of being angry, what Jonah should have been doing is he should have been in the city discipling these Ninevites, helping them mature in the Lord and be faithful, but instead he's sitting there pouting and angry at God. We see that Jonah, though in leadership, he was an immature prophet that was very unstable in all his ways. Jonah's attitude and actions in this narrative were not were written publicly, obviously written and published part of the the Torah, the Bible at that time, um, because it was also a rebuke for the Israelites. What was in Jonah was also true of the nation of Israel at this time. At when God called Abraham, he said he was going to bless him, and from his seed, his seed would be a blessing to the nations. And so God's plan for Israel was to be a blessing to the world. Their job was to proclaim Yahweh to the nations. It was not simply to be an isolated, worshiping community in the world. Therefore, when the Jews read the book of Jonah, and Jonah 4 specifically, it was was meant to rebuke them. Not only had Jonah become self-centered and self-focused to the neglect of his mission, so had the nation of Israel. Likewise, as we read this, it's easy to look at Jonah and say, look how pitiful Jonah is. But Jonah is us. Jonah is just like much of the church here today. We have all been commissioned and called to go and preach the gospel to every nation of the world. It's commonly been said, the book of Jonah is the most missionary book in the whole Old Testament and possibly the most missionary book, second most missionary book in the entire Bible after the book of Acts. For us as the church, instead of loving and witnessing to the world, Often the church just simply isolates itself in a holy huddle, sits in judgment on the world, on their views and their values, and they are sinful in many ways, and sometimes is even just simply apathetic towards towards the world. We lack the mercy, the compassion and action that God has towards unbelievers. Consequently, as we consider Jonah, we can discern common hindrances towards faithful ministry, common hindrances that are often in our hearts as well that keep us from faithfully ministering to the Lord and faithfully loving others. So hopefully we'll finish three points today. Um, Here's the first point, if you're taking notes. A hindrance to faithful ministry is uncontrolled negative emotions, including anger, self-pity, and a hopeless spirit. When the text says in verse 1 that Jonah became very angry, it literally means He burned like a fire. He burned like a fire as he saw God being merciful to the enemies, to those that he disliked. Um, He even is so angry that he asked the Lord to kill him here in verse 3. Now, this should stand out because we've seen this with prophets throughout the Old Testament, but not for the same reasons. With Moses, he prays to die because they're so difficult. Oh, Lord, did I birth these people? Do I have to really care for these people? Oh, Lord, just take me now. He's so frustrated with the unrepentance of the Israelites. And with Elijah in 1 Kings, I think it's 19, 1 Kings 19, he also prays, Lord, take me. The the, the, uh, Israelites are killing the prophets, and now they're trying to kill him. He's like, oh, Lord, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Just take my life. But Jonah Jonah is asking to die Because they have repented. It's the exact opposite of what we've seen with all the other prophets in the Old Testament. It doesn't make any sense. And then later in this same narrative, when God removes a plant that had given him comfort and shade from the sun, he declares he wants to die again. Oh God, I just want to die. It's so hot outside. Just take my life. I just don't want to live. Here we see one of, the, one of Jonah's major hindrances to ministry and also ours as well. And that is uncontrolled negative emotions, uncontrolled negative emotions. He was angry at God because he didn't agree with what God was doing. He was so angry he wanted to die, quit ministry and life. But again, when it was extremely hot, he despairs of life and wants to die again. Jonah's emotions are unbalanced 
and out of control. And this hindered his ministry to serve God as he should have, but also to serve the Ninevites that were experiencing a revival that he should have been serving even more. Uh, This is a common hindrance to any good work. God has given us emotions, um, has given us emotions as he is also an emotional being. We are made in his image. God is loving and at the same time angry. He is grieved and even jealous at times. The difference is God's emotions are always perfect. They're always perfect. They're righteous and they're appropriate. We're made in his image and therefore have emotions like him. However, our emotions are infected by sin and therefore are commonly self-focused instead of God-focused and others-focused. That's why one of the greatest commandments in the Bible are simply, that's why the greatest commandments are to love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul and to love our neighbor as ourself. God commands these things because they're no longer natural to us after the fall. Um, Our sinful nature makes us love ourselves more than God. That's why we neglect him and lack to spend time in uh, the word, lack, lack of prayer. We lack, we don't care for others as we should. We're more focused on ourselves. Our natural sin for nature has, is selfishly focused. This is why we get mad at God like Jonah does. And when we don't get our way or things don't happen the way that we think that they should work out. In addition, we get mad at others when they get in the way of our happiness or what we think is wise or best, this natural self-focus. When things don't happen the way that we think they should, like Jonah, we often struggle with negative emotions, sometimes out in control commotions towards God, others, or ourselves, sometimes our family members. These negative emotions hinder our ministry as they're often self-focused. This is in part why Scripture commonly commands us to control our emotions. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious for anything. Matthew 5, 44, we're commanded to love our enemy, the one that we despise. In Mark 6, 31, we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. Ephesians 4, 26, we're called to be angry and not sin. We're called to control our emotions as it's a mark of spiritual maturity, even as uncontrolled emotions is a mark of immaturity. That's what you commonly see with a, ch- a, a very young child, a toddler. They, they throw themselves on the floor. They're angry because their candy fell on the ground. There are the un- these are uncontrolled emotions that do not fit the circumstance. Look, the candies, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I remember one time when Saya was young. She's not in here right now. And her candy had fell on the ground. It was after church one day, and she was crying. I'm sitting there talking to her. I'm like, girl, I can buy you a thousand candies. And she stops. She stops crying. She looks at me, and she goes, <gasps> like that. And I just wanted to say, it, like, it's going to be okay. Daddy can take care of you. That's not that big of a thing. It was out of control in comparison to what had happened. Proverbs 25, 28 says this. Like a city that is broken down and without a wall, so is a person who cannot control his temper. In those days, uh, when, when nations did not have walls around them, they were commonly open for attack from others. That's what happens in the book of Nehemiah. As the Samaritans want to attack them, now that they're building a wall around them, they'd be able to protect themselves, have security. And so a person who's always angry or can't control their temper is like a city without walls. Everything sets them off. Somebody at church sets them off. Something on the TV sets them off. They're always angry, and this affects their ability to minister to God, to worship God, but also their ability to serve others. They're un- it's uncontrolled. Um, with Jonah, his uncontrolled emotions were fueled by wrong views about God and people, Therefore, God aimed to help him control his emotions and thoughts by asking him pointed questions. In verse 4, are you really so very angry? Verse 9, are you really so very angry about this little plant? Verse 11, should I not be even more concerned about Nineveh, this enormous city? Sometimes, and these are counseling skills, sometimes the best thing we can do when a person is struggling with uncontrolled emotions is calmly ask them questions and allow them to think about, think about their out-of-balance responses. 
kind of this, so, this uh, Socratic method. Socrat- the whole point was instead of rebuking someone, especially when it comes to rebuke, but teaching in general, sometimes when the answer comes to themselves, then they respond better than if you tell them they're wrong. So you give them questions, and all of a sudden they're right. Oh, yeah, this candy, I can have another piece of candy. It's not that big of a deal. By simply asking them questions, helping them think about it, the response comes to themselves, and they many times respond better. So God asked him pointed questions to help him think about his emotions. He also, God does, allows a purposeful and manufactured trial to teach him about God's love for creation, including children and animals, and show Jonah how unreasonable he was being. Are we controlling our emotions? Or is anxiety, worry, anger, unforgiveness, and other negative emotions controlling us? Unchecked negative emotions will make us unstable and unsuitable to minister to God and minister to others. We see this throughout Jonah's narrative. It's not just in chapter 4. It's pronounced in chapter 4. One moment, Jonah was asking to be killed by being thrown into the ocean. It's not the first time he wants to die. Jonah chapter 1. The next, he's praying for God to save him from drowning in Jonah 2. Then he praised God for salvation and recommitted to him while in the fish in Jonah 2 as well. One moment he's preaching to the Ninevites in Jonah 3. The next he's pouting and asking to die because God saves them in Jonah 4. One moment he's happy about a new plant that provided him with shade. Oh, thank you, God. The next he's sad because it's shriveled up and he wants to die again. Jonah was a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. You see it throughout the narrative. It's not just chapter 4. Many Christians, unfortunately, are like this and therefore ineffective and unfaithful in serving God and others. Their emotions and therefore their faith are out of control and unpredictable up and down like the waves of the sea. We may get a sense of the importance of guarding our hearts in Paul's command to the Ephesians to put on the breastplate of righteousness in Ephesians 6.14. Many believe that it is at least in part that it's at least in part a command to protect our thoughts and emotions. The breastplate the, the, in, in the armor protected the heart, the lungs, the loins, other vital organs. Symbolically in scripture and in the ancient world in general, these were commonly referred to or used symbolically referred to thoughts and emotions. Our heart, right, was the mind, will, and emotions. The stomach, when you're really nervous, you get butterflies in the stomach. So it was commonly used in the ancient world to refer to one's emotion. Paul actually uses this in Philippians 1.8. He says, I long for you with the loins or the bowels of Christ. This, the seat of emotions being in the bowels. And so may, part of what at least many, many people believe they're different, different the, with the uh, armor of God, there are lots of different arguments about what they mean, but it probably at least at part means this. Satan commonly will attack our emotions. He commonly attacks our emotions to make us all over the place, to distract us from God and doing as well, and sometimes even destroy us and others. Proverbs 4, 23 says this, Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Our family, our work, our church relationships, and everything else is affected by our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so this is part, this is normal for the Christian life to be attacked in these areas and we must be aware of them. Now, how should we control our negative emotions so that we can protect ourselves from being hindered from doing what God's called us to do? We're going to look at five just quick little points. One, to control our negative emotions, we must bring them honestly before the Lord in prayer. As seen with Jonah, God can handle our emotions. He can handle our wrong emotions and help us work through them. We should never condemn God or become angry at him. That was part of what, uh, what Job was praised for because Satan's job was to make him curse God. Sometimes that may be taught in Christian counseling unwisely. It's okay. Just be angry at God. Just tell him how mad you are at him. No, 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 no. That's what Satan was meant to do. And you're not supposed to help Satan do it and help, help them do what Satan wants them to do. Um, We should never charge God with wrong. Job is praised with that. But we should be honest with him about our struggles. This commonly happens in the Psalms. The psalmist pours out his fears, his worries, his negative circumstances. They're shooting arrows at me. They're lying about me. The wrong thoughts before God. And yet 
hoping in God's saving grace. Oh, soul, why are you disquieted within me? We shall hope in God. And so one of the ways that we do work, that work through these negative worries, these worries about our future, these worries about difficult at work, these worries about finals that are coming up, is bringing these emotions before God and allowing him to work in our hearts to bring us to peace and trust in him. Second, to control our negative emotions, we must evaluate them biblically, often with the help of others. We do this by considering our emotions against Scripture's teachings. We're called to be anxious for nothing, as we read in Philippians 4, 6. We're called to not be prideful or jealous or selfishly angry or seek vengeance. We also evaluate our emotions by having honest conversations with people. Uh, we also evaluate our, no, um, our emotions biblically by having honest conversations with people. Again, when God asked Jonah questions, it was meant to help him evaluate his thoughts and emotions. Were they justified, righteous, and like God's thoughts and emotions? Sometimes it helps to have conversations with godly, wise believers and allow them to challenge our thoughts and our emotions and encourage us biblically. Third, to control our negative emotions, we should act in line with Scripture regardless of how we feel. We should act in line with Scripture regardless of how we, sh we feel. We should love an enemy by acting in a loving way towards them even though we struggle with despising them right in the pit of our belly, right? The loins. We feel it right there. That person just gets on my nerves. We should pray and give thanks when we're anxious, asking for peace and God's sovereignty over a situation. Often when acting in accordance with righteousness, instead of our negative emotions, our emotions soon follow. You can be led by your emotions or you can lead your emotions. For example, when reading God's word and praying or going to church, though we don't feel like it at times, we soon find that doing so was good for us and we feel better about it. Likewise, by acting in a loving manner towards someone we previously despised or cared nothing about, we may, find, we may soon find ourselves lo truly loving them as we lead our emotions and act in a higher priority than what our emotions are saying. That's what a lot of biblical counseling is doing, giving them a biblical response. And as they respond, they find that there is joy that God gives and grace as he blesses our obedience Fourth, to control our negative emotions, we must live in the Spirit through practicing spiritual disciplines. According to Galatians 5, 22 through 23, self-control is actually a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control means even controlling your thoughts and even controlling your emotions. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Um, Galatians 5, 16 tells us how we grow this fruit of the Spirit. He says, Live by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is anger and outfits of rage and all these other things. However, when we live in the Spirit through prayer, worship, Bible study, obedience, service, God births or produces self-control in us. The problem, therefore, and we all struggle with negative emotions. Sometimes they're out-of-control emotions. I know I struggle with them myself. One of the problems with us in those time periods, and for many believers, is instead of living in the Spirit, what do we do? We visit the Spirit on occasion. We're kind of like tourists or temporary residents instead of a citizen who's living in these disciplines. As we grow in spiritual disciplines, the Spirit of God empowers us to control our negative emotions and thoughts, which hinder our ministry to God and others, as it did with Jonah. Paul said this to Timothy, who was apparently timid and considering leaving the ministry. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. The word self-discipline can be translated sound mind or sound judgment. Timothy, I know you're worried. I know people are looking down on you because you're young. You've got conflict happening in the church. You've got false teachers. You don't feel like you're up to the task. You want to quit. But God has not given you that spirit of anxiety, that timidity. But he's given you a, a spirit of power to do the task, love for people that are difficult, discipline so you can do the work you need to do so you can serve others, discipline to control your mind and your emotions so you don't destroy your ministry um, God has given you a spirit to help you do what you've been called to do. And so as we live in the spirit and living a lifestyle of abiding in God's word and prayer, God births self-control in us 
so that we're not controlled by our fear, our anger, our depression. doesn't mean they won't show up, but we have control over them and we're not bound and, um, bound and controlled by them. By practicing all these things, we're not denying our emotions, but we're not letting them rule over us or hinder our worship and obedience of God. As mentioned, when we act in obedience to God, oftentimes what happens is our emotions will begin to follow. It's part of us living a spiritual mature life. In this narrative, Jonah's emotions were ruling him instead of God. He was double-minded, unstable in all his ways, back and forth. I want to die. I'm happy. I'm sad. He's all over the place. His example of unfaithfulness was documented as a warning for Israel, but also for a warning for us. We must guard our hearts, for out of it flows the issues of life. It will hinder our obedience and our faithfulness to the mission. Satan gets me a lot with this, so I'm preaching to myself. Here's the next point. A hindrance to faithful ministry is a selective and twisted view of Scripture. A selective and twisted view of Scripture. In verse 2, Jonah rebukes God. That doesn't even make sense. Sounds wrong. Jonah rebukes God for his kindness, as though he never brought justice. He paraphrases a familiar theological statement that was common in the Old Testament um, about God's graciousness. The first time we see it, is in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, when God reveals his glory to Moses. He gives him this statement. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. God speaking about himself here. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but he by no means leaves the guilty unpunished. Responding to the transgression of fathers by dealing with children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. As you can clearly see here, when Jonah's rebuking God, what does he do? He quotes the first part of the scripture and leaves the second part off, right? As though God never brings justice, as though he's only gracious and merciful. He twists the scripture or he's selective about the part uh, that he uses before God. What's so ridiculous about Jonah's accusation is that God had both judged him and forgiven him not too much, not too long before this. For running from God's command, God sent a storm that almost killed Jonah. It was while Jonah was sinking in the sea that he prayed and God saved him through a large fish. And it wasn't until Jonah repented while in the fish that God spewed him onto dry land. The fish was both in a sense a lifeboat to save him, but a jail until he repented. It's not until he repents his prayer in Jonah 2 that he spewed out onto dry land. It's not that Jonah disliked God's graciousness to sinners. It's that he selfishly didn't feel others should experience it, especially the enemies of the Jews and maybe the Gentiles in general, depending how bad his ethnocentrism and stuff like that was. As we consider God being both just and the same time merciful, we must recognize this has always been perplexing to believers throughout biblical history, specifically in the Old Testament. They would often cry out, why do the wicked prosper? And why do the righteous suffer? This is perplexing when we look at the world. It's the same way today. However, the confusion is somewhat taken away when we understand God's patience, him being slow to anger. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient towards you, because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God waits to bring justice sometimes for an entire lifetime or for several generations, because he's patient and desires that none should perish. Consequently, when looking at the world often around us, it's often confusing and sometimes depressing, depressing. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do they get their own reality TV shows, have nice houses, get away with crimes while the righteous often struggle and depressed or going through difficult times? It's because God is patient. He's patient with us. He's patient with others. In fact, we see God's patience not only with the Ninevites in chapter 3, but we see it again here with Jonah in chapter 4. Initially, when Jonah ran, God's justice and mercy came after him, seeking to change him more into God's image. Then in this narrative, chapter 4, Jonah selfishly complains, but God graciously 
and patiently teaches him. Because of God's patience, there will be at times be great and prolonged, unfortunately, injustice in the world. We see it all the time. Many governments, prolonged injustice, prolonged crime, prolonged corruption in our governments. And yet, because of his patience and his mercy, there will also be great salvation and great revivals. Because in his patience, as with Nineveh, there was now a great revival, even though there are years of them living in rebellion and continual years, 150 years later, when God ultimately judges them through the Babylonians. With that said, the major hindrance to worship and service that we see in this text is Jonah's twisting of Scripture. His sinful misunderstanding of God caused him to falsely accuse God and perpetuated Jonah's own anger. As mentioned, he selectively left off God's justice from the same passage that focused on God's compassion and grace. We saw this uh, with Satan in, when, when Christ was tempted in the wilderness. Every time he approached Christ, he misused and he twisted Scripture to try to lead Christ into sin. Likewise, a selective and twisted view of Scripture is a common hindrance for us as well in ministering to God and ministering to others. For some... God is a God that prospers and blesses, but he does not judge. He is a God who heals, but not that one that brings or allows sickness, as he did with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, or the Corinthians who, who were sick and were judged. Some died in 1 Corinthians 11. We, uh, off, if we have a selective view of Scripture instead of a balanced view, we'll worship a caricature of God, an unhealthy exaggeration of him, a God of blessing and not a God of wrath and justice. Or a God of wrath and not a God of blessing. He's actually both in Scripture. Those who only see a God of blessing are often undisciplined uh, in their spiritual lives with no fear of God's discipline. They often get mad at God like Jonah did because he doesn't do what they wanted. On the other hand, those who only see a God of wrath or justice often have an unhealthy fear of God and tend to struggle with depression every time they fall into sin. They want to quit or give up. They feel like God doesn't love them and won't forgive them. Satan can easily harm them with condemnation when they fall, which pushes them away from God and away from God's church. In contrast, the difference between condemnation and conviction is the Holy Spirit convicts us, says this is wrong, and tells us to go back. He convicts us so we go back to God. He convicts us so we go back to the house of God, where condemnation pushes us away from God and pushes us away from God's church. If we're going to be faithful ministers to God and others, we must have a balanced, balanced view of Scripture instead of a selective, twisted view. A wrong view will hurt us and also hurt others as we share it with them. Satan is the one who twists Scripture to lead us away from God as people to sin. We must be very careful of becoming his mouthpieces, even if it's only into our own ears. How should we respond to the danger of a selective and twisted view of Scripture. Two, two ways. Because of the dangers of a selective and twisted view of Scripture, we must diligently study God's Word because God will hold us accountable for our lack of knowledge and our acting upon it. 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approve, uh, as one approve a worker who do not, does not need to be ashamed who rightly handles the word of truth. Matthew 5, 19. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. There's consequences for our, our disobedience, but also for our teaching. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Second, because of the dangers of a selective and twisted view of Scripture, Ministers must teach the whole counsel of God and not just choose their favorite passages or their favorite doctrines. In Acts 20, 26 to 27, Paul said this, Therefore I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of you all, for I did not hold back from announcing to you the whole purposes of God. Those who sit under half-truths of God's word are prone to deception and prone to idolatry as they can't discern error mixed with truth. There's an, there's an unbalance. Again, they make caricatures of God that do not fit the full, full counsel of God's scripture. 
By teaching the full counsel, ministers raise up mature Christians who will be less vulnerable to deception and more capable in their ministry to others. Again, Jonah had a selective and twisted view of Scripture which hindered his ministry to the Ninevites and God, and it will do the same for us. How do we view God? Does it match what Scripture says? Or is it a perversion that will hinder our worship and our ministry? Is God overly harsh, overly merciful, or even apathetic? The God of Scripture is perfect, and we must know him correctly to both properly worship and to properly minister to others. Here's our last point. A hindrance to faithful ministry is an idolatrous focus on comfort, an idolatrous focus on comfort and at times wealth. Again, while Jonah's outside the city waiting for God to judge it, God began to work on Jonah's wrong attitudes and misplaced priorities. God called for a plant to quickly spring up and provide shade over Jonah's head. This delighted Jonah because obviously it was a hot, uh, a sunny day. Then surprisingly, it says Jonah was happy. Then God commands a worm. Remember, one of the major themes of the book of Jonah is God's sovereignty. He appoints a, appoints a storm. He appoints a fish. He calls the fish to throw, throw him out. He, he, pay, he calls for a plant to grow. He calls for a worm. God's sovereignty is mentioned throughout the book of Jonah, one of the major themes of this book. So God sends a worm to destroy the plant and a hot east wind to blow on Jonah's head. The sun and the hot wind... Uh, as they blow on Jonah's head, he begins to despair of life and again claims that he wants to die in verse 8. God used the gift of the plant and its removal to teach Jonah a lesson. God often does the same with us. He gives us many blessings. He gives us a friend who's a tremendous comfort and encouragement. And then out of nowhere, he or she moves away or the relationship ends for whatever reason. He provides a job that meets all of our needs, but then out of the blue takes it away. With these blessings and the removal of them, God encourages us for a season, but also reveals sinful attitudes in our heart or idols that have been called. Sometimes the gifts of God become idols for us. Uh, Our marriages, sometimes our children can become an idol. Our jobs can become idols. And like I believe what happens, the reason God asked for Abraham's child, this child he'd been waiting for his whole life, the child of promise, I believe it had become an idol. And so he asked for the child just to get his heart right. Um, this is how God uses trials in our lives. They challenge us, they test our faith, and if we submit to them, he reveals our weaknesses, our idols, our wrong attitudes, and helps us get rid of them and equips us for more ministry. After the plant dies and Jonah's in despair because of it, God asks him, are you really so angry about this just little plant? Jonah confirms his desperation it's not so much that Jonah had become, really became friends with this plant and was really excited about this plant. What was it? It was the comfort. It was the comfort that this plant provided that Jonah was angry about. Um, God says to him, if Jonah was angry about the loss of comfort from a random plant that died, should not God be more concerned about 120,000 people who don't know right and wrong and many animals in Nineveh as well? When God referred to the 120,000 people who didn't know right from wrong, some believe, as I've mentioned before, that he's referring to children. They don't know this is wrong. They don't know not to stick their finger into the the, the electric socket. They don't know right from wrong. If this is true, then there are at least 600,000 people in the city or at least in the surrounding areas as well. If this is correct, the logic behind the question was, though the parents deserve judgment because of their sins, but what about all those children? who don't even know right or wrong yet. Yeah, maybe their parents have done a lot of evil, but what about the kids? And what about the animals? Shouldn't God have mercy on them as well? Others, however, believe that God is simply referring to people who lack spiritual or moral discernment. In their culture, like many of our cultures today, and I can say this is an American, like my culture, what was wrong was right. And what was right was wrong. Everything had started to become backwards in the Ninevite culture, as we see it happening in many, many countries around the world. When God referred to the animals, he was probably demonstrating how even the animals had more value than the plant. They were beings, the plant. You, even the animals have more value than the plants, and you're not worried about the destruction. You're worried about the plant's destruction. What about animals? They're more important than the plant. 
This is a hindrance for many believers. God has given us all the great commission to go and preach the gospel to all nations. However, for many, including myself, their greatest hindrance is their comfort. It's uncomfortable being around people who speak a different language and have different cultural expectations. It's hard to buy food and clothes, eat and navigate society. Consequently, they feel no compulsion to go to these places, and if they're already there, they want to leave quickly. But the souls of those people are more important than our comforts. Many can't do ministry to the needy because they can't leave the comforts of home and family and country. Though Jonah seems tone deaf when we're looking at this passage and hardened in this narrative, he, re- he represents much of the evangelical church around the world. Comfort and materialism are more important than the souls and God's mission. Likewise, we get a good picture of this in Luke 9, 57, where there's a man who approaches Christ and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. In Matthew 8, 19, which is a parallel passage, it tells us he was a scribe. This means that he meticulously copied the Old Testament law, probably had, uh, because part of the way you memorize something is by writing things down. He probably had whole uh, books of the Old Testament memorized. He was a teacher of God's law. However, he had a major flaw. In response to the man, Christ could look at this man's heart and said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Christ knew Comfort and luxury were this religious man's idols that would hinder his actual desire to do ministry that he proclaimed. Essentially, Christ says to him, foxes have a better home than I do, and birds are more comfortable than me. Are you really sure you want to be my disciple? Likewise, we must recognize that the desire for comfort and luxuries can be a major hindrance to our ministries as well. It can keep us from doing God's will, loving others and serving them. When Abraham was called from Mesopotamia, he had no guarantee things would be more comfortable in Cana than the land he had left. And what happens is, you know what happens. When he gets there, what's happening? There's a famine there. There's a famine right when he got to the land. This caused him to leave the promised land and head to Egypt where he almost lost his wife to Pharaoh. His life in Mesopotamia and Egypt were more comfortable, at least as far as the amenities, but they weren't where God wanted Abraham to be. Canaan was. Likewise, we must be careful of our desires for comfort and luxuries. There are often hindrances to the work of ministry. In Luke 14, 26 to 27, Christ said, if we're going to be, our, be his disciples, we must hate our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our brothers and sisters, and even our own lives. And we must take up our crosses if we're going to be our disciples, bearing all types of pain and discomfort to be his disciples and do the ministries God calls us to. Even though as disciples we have committed, each one of us, if you're a follower of Christ, you have committed to take up your cross. You've committed, like Romans chapter 12, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, including at times being inconvenienced and uncomfortable. But each one of us, we often jump off our crosses or we jump off our altars. We're often shocked when following him leads us into famine or removes our comfort. Like Abraham, we at times flee to Egypt get mad at God, or doggedly cling to our comforts rather than submit to God's will for our lives. Often God needs to rebuke us like he did with Jonah and say, does your comfort matter more than the souls around you? We're not told how Jonah responds. The author, like a good movie or TV show, leaves us on the cliffhanger, which is probably meant to make us wonder what what Jonah's response is, but also look at our own hearts. Do our comforts matter more to us than lost souls? Will we leave home, family, job, and comfort to reach people that God cares about? The good thing about this cliffhanger is that if Jonah is the author, which most believe, that implies he repented of the nationalistic pride which caused him to despise the Ninevites. He repented of his love of comfort more than the restoration of God's creation and people. He repented, and so can we. God's kingdom must be more important than our comforts and luxuries. I want to invite EPT up here. The story of Jonah was meant to challenge the nation of Israel. 
They were called to be lights to the Gentiles, including those who hated and mistreated them as the Assyrians did. They were not simply called to have a holy huddle where they cared for themselves and looked down on others. They were called to reach out to the nations so that they could know Yahweh as well. The church, again, has the same mission, to go and make disciples of all nations around the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Will we, on a cliffhanger, complete our mission? What are our hindrances to faithfully completing it? Jonah ministered to the Ninevites, but he was not faithful. He might be called effective because there was a great revival, but he was not faithful. He preached, but didn't even desire for them to repent. When they, decide, when they started changing, he didn't stay to disciple them. He became mad at God for forgiving them and hoped that God would change his mind and judge them. His ministry was effective, but it wasn't faithful. It was not pleasing to God, and certainly God couldn't use Jonah as much as he would have liked to until he got rid of the hindrances in his heart, the pride, the selfishness, the anger, the love of comfort, and his evil nationalism that was hindering his work. What are hindrances to faithful ministry that we must be careful of? A hindrance to faithful ministry is uncontrolled negative emotions, including anger, self-pity when we go through something that's difficult. Oh God, why? Why me? Why did this happen to me? A hopeless spirit. Satan knows that a discouraged Christian many times becomes so self-focused that they're ineffective in worshiping God and caring for others. So he aims to make us so self-focused, all about us, about our problems. A hindrance to faithful ministry is a selective and twisted view of Scripture. He had a wrong view of God, and that's part of the reason he's angry at him. A hindrance to faithful ministry is an idolatrous focus on comfort and at times wealth. I want to take some time to respond in prayer. In your bulletin on the PPT, we have some prayer prompts for us to pray through. We all struggle with negative emotions, sometimes out of control emotions. I certainly do. Pray for God to give us a sound mind through his spirit and deliver us from uncontrolled thoughts and emotions that we can give, have grace to take them captive, including our anger, self-pity, hopelessness, and depression and lust. Pray for God to teach us his word and deliver us from unbiblical views about him and others and unbiblical views about ourselves. We condemn ourselves because we have a wrong view of ourselves. Pray for God to increase our love for him and others so we can do the work of evangelism, discipleship, and also pray that God will forgive us for not loving him and others as we should. Pray for God to teach us contentment and deliver us from the idols of wealth and comfort so we can serve him and others better. Let's just take a second to respond in prayer. Make this your prayer for yourself individually. Make this your prayer for the church. Make this truth a prayer for Handong as a community, HIS as a community, that God would raise up people who are faithful to the mission and not self-focused on themselves or simply self-focused on the people that they care about instead of those outside of them. Pray that we'd be faithful in doing the work of missions. Let's pray for ourselves and others. Father, we just come before you. We ask for forgiveness. Uh, We have been like Jonah, and we have been like Israel, consumed with our, um, our our comfort, our blessings, our careers, our retirement, and not consumed with your mission and the people that mean more than our comforts. And so, Father, we pray that you work in us to will and do of your good pleasure.
we ask that you would be, make us a missional people. For some of us, it's harder to stay in our home country than it is to go to another country. We ask wherever you've called us to be, that you help us to be faithful to your mission. Help it to be our daily thoughts as we pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be on, done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask that you equip every student at HIS, every one of our students at Handong, every one of our professors and staff, our military members and those who faithfully serve. We ask, dear Father, Lord, that you help us to be um, faithful servants and teachers and students of Christ and that we'd be faithful in doing your mission. We pray that not just for us, but for your church throughout the world. We thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up and close in worship together. Sing, Father, rest my soul. Father, rest my soul. In Christ alone. No. should rise in the ocean Spirit right now would do surgery on our hearts, that he would get rid of any wrong views about him, wrong views about his word, get rid of any idols in our heart that would keep us from sacrificially serving him, taking up our cross and offering ourselves as living sacrifice on the altar, that God would cleanse each one of us and not just us, that he cleanse our community, our broader community, that he cleanse the church in Korea of the idols that hinder worship and hinder service, cleanse the churches in various nations around the world, that he'd raise up a church in this time frame, that he would purify, that he'd wash, he'd cleanse, that'd be ready to do mission, but also be ready to suffer. As we get closer to his coming, suffering will only get worse for those who are true followers of Christ. Pray that he would purify our hearts right now and raise up a church, the church, that's ready to do the work of mission. Let's make that our prayer right now. in prayer, if you could just put your hand on the shoulder of somebody next to you or just pray for, have, be thinking about someone as we pray. Father, we want to thank you for the brothers and sisters that you surround us with. And we pray that you would do a work in them. You say you promised in Philippians chapter one that the work that you began in them, that you'll complete into the day of Christ. And so we pray that you'd purify their hearts. You said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. We pray that they would see you we pray that they'd know you in a deeper way, a manner that they've never known you before. We pray that your word would be sweeter, more enjoyable than it's ever been before. We pray that you strengthen their arms and their feet and their mind, that you gird up the loins of their mind, as it says in Scripture.
that they be ready to serve and that you would use them mightily for your work. And we pray against every attack and every temptation, every way he attacks their thoughts and their minds, their hearts. We pray that every work of the devil would come down in Jesus' name. But they would be, they would have a, that they'd live in the spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline, sound mind, sound judgment that you've given them to complete the work you've called them through, even in difficult times. We thank you for our brothers and sisters, and we thank you we get to partner with them in the work of ministry. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. We worship you, God. Amen. God bless you. Finish strong. Have a wonderful last week of school.